Hi, Kim 151 students, and welcome back to the second lecture of this week, week 10, about acids and bases. Uh, we're going to be uh, focusing here on weak acids and weak bases, and specifically their equilibria in this lecture. So what makes a weak acid a weak acid is that unlike a strong acid, it does not completely dissociate. Uh, so there is an equilibrium to its acid reaction. Uh, so here we have the uh, weak acid, which we'll generally call uh, weak acids, HA as a uh, kind of general generic term. And what's happening is that the HA is donating a proton here to the water. And as I mentioned before, in, in these equilibria, you could choose to show the water or not. Usually your book does. So another way to do this would be like this. Uh, or you can show the, the water actually getting the H plus and um, and then it, the H, the water gets the H plus and you have H3O plus hydronium one more hydrogen. Also the charge is up by one from zero up to positive one. And what's left over is the conjugate base of the weak acid, which is what you have after the H plus is gone. And so there's a, an A here and it's A minus because when the H plus leaves, it leaves an electron behind, which leaves that negative charge. It's the anion here in the acid, the negative ion. So either way, whether we write it like this or we write it like this, we can write a K for this reaction. So let's say you were gonna write a, a KC for this reaction where the acid is acting like an acid and giving up its H plus. Well, you know, if we're writing the KC, so KC, it's gonna be uh, products over reactants. So the product here would be, uh, if we're writing it from this one, it would be H, whoops, H3O plus, I don't know why I wrote an A there. Uh, it would be H3O plus. Uh, and then the other product would be A minus. <clears throat> and that would be divided by concentration of HA. And we would not include water because it's not aqueous. It's pure liquid. Uh, the, it's the bulk of this. It's mostly water. So its concentration would not be changing very much. Equivalently, if we wrote, if we had the reaction like this, we could write the Kc as uh, H plus over A minus divided by HA. But as I was telling you before, uh, aqueous H plus and H3O plus, these are kind of considered interchangeable. Right, uh, these are kind of the same thing. Uh, we do know that if there's an H plus in water, it's generally going to be attached to the water making H3O plus. So these, these two things are essentially interchangeable. <clears throat> the point is that if we're writing a K for a reaction like this, uh, it gets a special name. It's the Ka for this weak acid. The, the K for the reaction where this weak acid is giving up its proton to water. And we call that the acid dissociation constant, also known as Ka. And it's not written any different than any other K you're used to writing. It's products, you know, like just like we wrote here. See, when we wrote Kc for this reaction, we got the same thing as we get here. It's just it's given a special name because it's it's a, a specific reaction that HA is undergoing in which it's giving up its proton, which is what acids do, right? And so <clears throat> the Ka can give us a measurement of how strong an acid is. The greater the Ka, that means there's more of the products here. And so a large Ka indicates that this reaction is going quite far forward to reach equilibrium and it's dissociating significantly. Whereas a small Ka would indicate that this acid does not dissociate significantly and it has, stays mostly as reactants. It would mean this is bigger and this is smaller. And so uh, the, the, the size of the Ka basically tells us how strong the acid is. Uh, yeah, bigger Ka, stronger acid. Smaller Ka, weaker acid. So we can see here there's a variety of uh, Ka values. Uh, we have one for hydrochloric acid. Its K value, Ka value is about 2 times 10 to the 6th. Uh, so really, really huge uh, because it's a strong acid, stronger than water, uh, stronger than hydronium rather. 
Uh, for, and then there's the Ka's for a variety of weak acids here with their Lewis structures also shown. And you can see those Ka's are actually less than one. And we have stronger and stronger acids because we see higher and higher Ka's. Now, another uh, quantity that we can calculate is known as pKa. And pKa works like pH. So pH, uh, we know, is the negative log of the hydronium or the H plus, either one. We can call it either one, right? And the pOH is the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. Well, pKa is the negative log of the Ka. Uh, so the reason why we use these is because you can see pH and pOH and pKa come out to numbers that are very easy to write down. Uh, and so it's rather convenient. And particularly when you're studying O-chem and biological chem, they rarely write down Ka's. They most often write down pKa's because they're just much more convenient numbers. Uh, so, for example, if we were looking at nitrous acid here, the pKa would be the negative log of this Ka, and we could calculate that. Uh, so, if we take out our Casio again, we go to the negative log of the Ka, 4.5 uh, times 10 to the minus 4. Make sure to use your EE or EXP, and we get 3.35 for the pKa. And likewise, if we have a pKa, like let's say this one here, 3.74, and we want to get to the Ka, we would it would work the same way. Uh, it would be that the K, oops, would be that the uh, Ka is going to be the antilog of the negative pKa, in the same way that the uh, hydronium or H plus concentration is the antilog of the negative pH. Uh, <clears throat> and so let's say we wanted to take the antilog of the, of the negative pKa here and get the Ka. So we'll do this one right here. Uh, this one for the formic acid. So if we do the antilog of the negative pKa 3.74 we get 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 for the Ka. And so, uh, yeah, make sure to be aware that there's such a thing as pKa as well. Sometimes you'll be given Ka, sometimes you'll be given pKa's, and you'll have to switch between them. Uh, but you can see here a larger Ka indicates a weaker acid and, or sorry, a larger Ka indicates a stronger acid. So stronger acid here, larger Ka, weaker acid, smaller Ka. pKa goes opposite to that. The larger the pKa, the weaker the acid. The smaller the pKa, the stronger the acid. <clears throat> uh, so you're, there are going to be a couple of problems associated with Ka. One type of problem is where you'll be given the pH of a solution and its initial concentration of weak acid and be asked to determine the Ka. Then there's going to be another type of question where you, given the Ka and the initial concentration, asked to determine the equilibrium pH. So this is directly analogous to what we did in, in chapter 17. There were also a couple types of problems. One was where you were given equilibrium concentrations and asked to determine Kc, or you were given Kc and initial concentrations and asked to determine the equilibrium concentrations. These problems are going to be approached exactly the same way. And so <clears throat> let's start here with the kind of simpler problem where we're given initial concentrations and the pH and we're asked to determine the value of Ka. <clears throat> it will be useful to set up an ice table even though we don't have to solve for x here because we can, uh, we can figure out what the concentrations are. Uh, so sometimes people like to set up an ice table. So let's start by writing down the reaction. I kind of got a bit ahead of myself, but uh, we our acid here, that's our weak acid HF. We write water as a reactant. Again, we could always write this as, you know, the other way would be HF uh, in equilibrium here, making H plus and F minus. That's okay too. That's, that's one way I like to write it, but your book writes it with the water all the time. Perfectly fine both ways. 
there's an equilibrium here and the H plus is going to be given from the HF so we're going to get H3O plus here and what's left the conjugate base of HF after the H plus leaves you have no H and the charge is one lower from zero down to negative one so we have fluoride ion <clears throat> and so now uh, we can set up an ice table here. It does help us to do the stoichiometry. We're, we're not going to have to solve for uh, X, solve for an equilibrium concentration. Uh, we're, we're, we know the equilibrium concentration because we're given the equilibrium pH. A word about these types of problems is often they don't specify the word equilibrium. They just say the pH of this weak acid is this. It is, the equilibrium is implied. It is that, you know, you put this acid in water, of course it has reached equilibrium. You're checking the pH. It's already reached equilibrium. So this pH is giving you the equilibrium concentration of the H+. <clears throat> so initially, there was 0 0.250 moles of HF. There's, there's very little H3O plus. And this is going to be the first approximation that we almost always do in, in these types of calculations. Yes, in pure water, there is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar of H3O plus. However, that is generally so small that it's negligible. If you go on to more advanced chemistry classes, you may have to account for that. Uh, but in this class, it will always be true. The problems are written in such a way that the, the concentration of hydronium in neutral water is, is negligible. So we say it's about zero. And there's no fluoride to start. <clears throat> then, uh, since these, there's no products, Q is, is zero. The reaction has to go forward uh, here. And so we'll have minus X plus X and plus X. The thing is that we can figure out what X is because we have the pH here, okay? Uh, so we can actually figure out what X is and we can figure out all the concentrations of these because the pH is gonna give us the equilibrium concentration of hydronium. So X is the hydronium concentration, which is the anti-log of the negative pH. So we're going to take the anti-log of the negative pH here. And so let's calculate that. Notice that we have three after the decimal here, so we can write our result with three significant figures. <clears throat> so we're going to do the anti-log. So be sure to hit second and log. That gives you that anti-log. And then negative 2.036 equals... And so we're going to write this with three sig figs, so it's going to be 9.20 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, or 0 0.00290 molar. Uh, same thing here. Okay. It's kind of handy to have it in standard notation, so we can do this subtraction pretty easily. So that's X. So we've got the concentration of hydronium, got the concentration of, of fluoride. To get the concentration of the HF, it's going to be 0 0.250 minus this. So let's keep this number. I'll keep it on my calculator here, and we're going to move on to the next slide. So the Ka here uh, for this reaction, it's going to be the concentration of hydronium times the concentration of fluoride divided by the concentration of HF. We don't include water because it's the bulk liquid. And so the fluoride and the hydronium concentration were equal to X. They were 0 0.0029. Then for the HF, it's going to be 0 0.25 minus 0 0.00, not 2992, sorry. And so we do that subtraction. And remember, when we do subtraction for sig fig, we have to look at the place value. So uh, this one's three after the decimal. This one goes to five after the decimal, but we're not going to be able to go past three past the decimal uh, in our result. So this is going to be the limit here. And so when we subtract, we get 0 0.25 minus 0 0.0092. <clears throat> and this gives us 0 0.24808. And uh, we're going to round right here where the zero is, so the eight is there, so we round up and we get 0 0.241 because that is three after the decimal right there. 
And so now we've got all of the concentrations. We can plug them in. We're going to plug in 0 0.0092 for these and 0 0.241 for the HF. So let's plug that in. 0 0.0092 for both of these guys. 0 0.241 for the HF. And now we can calculate 0 0.0092. That's going to be squared. Divide by... 0 0.241 and we get uh, 3.51 times 10 to the minus 4 and that's our result so this was not so bad because we didn't have to solve for x uh, again be careful parsing these problems because they are very they're very much like the the kind in the last chapter where we were given equilibrium concentrations and we just have to plug them in to the k expression to get the k <clears throat> however in these problems they'll just say the ph of the weak acid is this and they won't use the word equilibrium but when they're saying that the ph of the weak acid is this it's implied that they're talking about equilibrium there Okay, and later you'll be asked to determine the pH of the weak acid, and it's also implied that we're talking about when it has reached equilibrium. Okay. Oh yeah, and the pKa. So we're supposed to get the pKa to the pKa is a negative log of the Ka. So let's plug that in. So we say negative log three point five one. <clears throat> times 10 to the minus 4 and we get 3.454692 and so forth. Since we are taking the log of a number that has three sig figs, we will round to three after the decimal point, which is where this four is. Since there's a six, we round up. It is 3.455. Four is rounded up to a five for the pKa. Okay. So that is the simpler version of the problem. We don't have to solve for x, so we don't have to deal with quadratics or the simplifying assumption or anything like that. <clears throat> we were given the concentration of hydronium because we were given the pH of the solution. Now this is the more complicated of the two problems. So again, just like there were two types of problems in the, the equilibrium chapter, chapter 17, where uh, we were we just did the previous one we were given the equilibrium concentrations find the k now we're given the k and the initial concentrations and asked to find the equilibrium concentration but again it never says equilibrium it just says calculate the ph it is it is implied that they mean when the acid is at equilibrium and so this is going to be our initial concentration and we're going to have to solve for x here so let's write out the equation for HCN behaving like an acid. It is an acid. We've given the Ka for the acid. So HCN and water as reactants. The H plus is going to go from the HCN over to the water. And so we get H3O plus, the H plus of the conjugate acid of water. And the conjugate base of the HCN after it has lost the H plus is the cyanide ion, Cn minus. So the H is gone and the charge is down by one from zero down to negative one. And so now we definitely need to set up an ice table. So we're gonna set up an ice table. We're gonna plug in our initial concentration, 0.1 molar, right in there. Uh, again, we're going to assume that the concentration of hydronium is about zero. Uh, <clears throat> now, again, th there is a small amount of H3L plus even in pure water. 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar at 25 degrees Celsius. However, we're just assuming here that it's small enough not to matter. And generally that will be the case. Unless x is quite small, uh, it, it will not matter how much was originally there. And of course we have no cyanide to start. This, there's no product, so Q is 0, Q is less than K. The reaction must go forward. Uh, obviously it can't go backwards. And so we're going to put minus x here, and this will be plus x here, and plus x here. So for equilibrium, we'll have 0 0.1 minus x, that's what goes here. And then this will be 0 plus x, or just x, and 0 plus x, x. Okay. 
And so now we're going to write the Ka expression, and this time we have to solve for x. So like in chapter 17, no, no difference. We're just going to, you know, write the Ka and plug in our equilibrium values stated in terms of x in there, and we're going to solve for x. We may have to use a simplifying assumption. We're going to use a simplifying assumption a lot in this chapter and the next chapter. So, uh, you know, uh, you've already practiced a little bit with it. We're going to keep on using it. So our Ka expression is going to be the products H3O plus and cyanide ion <clears throat> over our reactant HCN and water we don't include again. And now we're going to plug in our equilibrium concentration stated in terms of X. So let's just keep this for the next slide here. Uh, we're going to plug these in um, just to give you a little preview here since I have room. So this is going to be uh, x times x over 0 0.10 minus x. Okay, so keep that in mind for the next slide. And that's going to be equal to the Ka, which is right here. It's going to be equal to 4.9 times 10 to the minus 10. And that is equal to Ka. So I'm just going to, if I can, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep this. So x times x over 0.1 minus x, right? Uh, and that was equal to 4.9 times 10 minus 10. So 4.9 times 10 minus 10 equals x times x over 0.1 minus x. And this is where we're going to want to try to use the simplifying assumption. <clears throat> so we're going to do our pre-check. Pre-check here. What we do to pre for pre-check is we take our point, our initial concentration was 0.1, and we divide it by our k, and we want to see that this is at least 400. And as you can see here, it is far greater than 400. So we can be quite assured that x will be small. So for that reason, 0.1 minus x will be about the same as 0.1 because x is going to be really, really tiny. So when we subtract it from 0.1, it's not really going to make any difference. So we're going to say that this is about equal to x squared over 0.1 because 0.1 minus x is about 0.1. So now this is going to make it a lot easier for us to solve for x squared. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll multiply both sides times 0.1 here. So let's do that. So times 0 0.1 times 0 0.10. And so we get uh, 4.9 times 10 to the minus 11 equals x squared. And then we'll take the square root. So let's do that. Uh, so we'll do square root 4.9 times 10 to the minus 11 equals. And we get uh, 7 times 10, 7.0 times 10 to the minus 6. And that is X, and that is also the concentration of H3O+. plus. So we're almost done now. Because our goal was to get the pH. So now that we've got the hydronium concentration, we just take the negative log of that to get the pH. So the hydronium concentration is going to be a negative log, uh, or the pH is going to be a negative log of the hydronium concentration. So negative log 7 times 10 to the minus 6, and we get a uh, pH of 5.15 and again we're taking the log of a number with two sig figs so we write the result with two places after the decimal so we round where the 5 is here 5.15 is our pH. <clears throat> so those are the two types of problems having to do with Ka. You either have to uh, you know find the Ka given the initial concentrations and the, the pH or you find the pH giving the initial, given the initial concentration of the Ka. And this, this, the, for that, this problem we just did here, notice that the, the procedure does not, is not any different than uh, what we did in chapter 17. It's just applied to, to acids. That's it. We still use the same simplifying assumption. We still solve for x. Uh, we, you know, we write out the K. The K is written the same way. The only difference is you just need to know how to write this reaction. That's the big difference. You need to be able to write the reaction for HCN behaving like an acid and giving its proton to water. If you can write this reaction, you've got half the battle at that point. 
then you're just you're just doing an, an equilibrium problem like you've done before. No difference really. Uh, and so this is a list of steps from your book. Uh, like I said, the most important step in doing this uh, is is to write the equation and, and the, the proton transfer. Uh, you know, identify the reaction uh, and then make your ice table. S substitute the equilibrium concentration stated in terms of X, solve for X, uh, calculate the concentrations, and then particularly you're usually trying to get the pH, so you take the negative log of the hydronium concentrations. Now, one uh, idea related to this is the percentage of dissociation of the acid. And so, although the Ka is always the same, uh, the percentage of dissociation depends on the initial concentration of the acid. So, for strong acids, it's always 100% dissociation. But for a weak acid, the percentage of dissociation depends on the Ka and also on what the initial concentration is. And I'm going to use an example with acetic acid here to demonstrate this. So this is, and we're gonna do some math which is shown in this, but these two points in this graph. So this is showing the concentration, the initial concentration of the acetic acid. And uh, so if it's low, you're, if it's a low concentration, your percentage of dissociation is higher than if it's a higher concentration, the percentage of dissociation is lower. But either way, the Ka is the same. As long as the, the temperature does not change, the equilibrium constant would not be any different. Uh, <clears throat> so the percent dissociation is calculated in this way. It's the, the concentration of the HA that has dissociated, that has separated, divided by the initial concentration, and then times 100%. So I'm not going to calculate uh, the percentage dissociation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to state a certain percentage dissociation and show that uh, the Ka remains the same. So Ka for this acetic acid, if we're, what we're doing here in this too, and this is a very common abbreviation here, is for the acetate ion C2H3O2 uh, minus, I'm going to call that AC minus very common abbreviation for acetate ion, just to save some space. And so for our, our, our acetate ion, the dissociation is this, uh, if we're writing it in terms of H, uh, AC, it's HAC plus H2O, and then we make hydronium, and then what's left is the acetate ion, AC minus, and this is aqueous liquid aqueous aqueous so let's say that we're in this situation where we have four up uh, or rather this situation first we have 0.42 percent dissociation of one molar acetic acid okay so we have one molar acetic acid and and 0.42 percent of that is dissociate it's dissociating so the amount that actually dissociated is the one molar times 0.42 percent. So uh, if we're calculating that here, the way we calculate that is 0.42 percent. To turn that into a decimal, we divide by 100, and so we get point, uh, 0.42 percent is equal to 0 0.0042, and then multiply that times one molar, we get obviously one, we get 0 0.0042 molar. So that's how much HA has dissociated. And if, and so that's the, uh, so if we're calculating this here, that's how much H3O plus was produced. That's how much acetate was produced. And the amount of HAC that's left is the one molar minus this. So we're gonna plug those in. So it was, this is how much it dissociated. So it produced this many molarities of H3O plus, this many molarities of, a, of, of the acetate ion, and the concentration for the, the acid is the one molar that we started with minus the 0 0.0042 that dissociated. And so if we calculate 
the Ka from this. So it's 0 0.0042 squared divide by 1 minus 0 0.0042. And we get about 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, as would be expected, because that's the Ka for the acetic acid. And so we can see that at this concentration of 1 molar, acetic acid will be 0.42% dissociated. Uh, now, let's do the same thing, but with a smaller initial concentration of acetic acid. If, if it's 0.1 molar, what we observe is that 4.2% of the, of the uh, acetic acid dissociates, which means that if we multiply this here, we have 4.2%, let's turn that to a decimal. So we divide by 100%, and that turns it into a decimal. That decimal is 0 0.042. And then we multiply by the initial concentration of the acetic acid, which was times 0 0.01 and so we get 0 0.00042 or 4.2 times 10 to the minus 4. So that's our concentration in molarities. So now what we can do to, to confirm that the Ka is the same, we'll plug it into the Ka expression. So this time our hydronium and acetate concentration is 0 0.00042 our, our concentration of the, the acetic acid is the 0.01 molar we started with minus the 0 0.00042 that we lost. And if we calculate the Ka from that, we have 0 0.00042 squared divide by 0 0.01 minus 0 0.00042. Equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And so, what I'm trying to demonstrate for you here is how you could calculate the percent dissociation if you had the concentrations from your ice table. You would calculate you could calculate it by dissociated over initial times 100 percent, and also the fact that although the percent dissociation depends on the initial concentration. Notice that when the initial concentration was one molar, the acetic acid was only 0.42% dissociated. But when the initial concentration was 0.01 molar, much smaller, the percent dissociation was much greater, 4.2%. However, in both cases, the Ka is the same. The Ka doesn't change, but uh, the, percent, the percent association depends on the initial concentration, but the Ka does not. The Ka only depends on temperature, okay? So that's what I was trying to demonstrate to you here. And calculating percent association is a relatively simple matter. You just calculate how much dissociated uh, divide by the, the initial. So in this case, if we were going backwards and calculating the percent dissociation, our amount dissociated, whoops, in this case, we as we calculated was 0 0.0042, and our initial concentration was one molar, and then we would multiply times 100% to get the percent dissociation, we get 0.42% dissociation, okay. Uh, and I could do that here too. So calculating the percent dissociation is pretty straightforward, but sometimes people are thrown off by the fact that the percent dissociation is, it depends on the initial concentration. Uh, the Ka does not. Now, another thing that can be calculated is, is uh, equilibria for pro polyprotic acids. And the, the actual, uh, the process of doing it is quite involved because a polyprotic acid is an acid that can lose more than one proton. However, as we're going to see in the course of this calculation, it's usually only the first proton that makes every, any difference. And after you see this example, you'll be just fine in when you calculate these to stop once you get past the first proton. 
but I think it is instructive to see a complete calculation to see why it is that the loss of the first proton is the only one that matters in terms of the pH anyway. Uh, so let's say we're talking about carbonic acid. This is a diprotic acid. It has two protons because the carbonate ion is negative two in charge. And so it's going to have two acid dissociations. One will be the loss of the first proton. So here we have the H2CO3. It's giving one proton. And so you see it loses one, but it still has another one. And the charge goes down by one unit from zero down to negative one. We get bicarbonate ion. That's the conjugate base of the carbonic acid after it loses one proton. And then the water picks up a proton. And so we have one more H and a plus. And so we have the conjugate acid of water, which is hydronium. But this bicarbonate can go on to lose a second proton. So what we do is we have two Ka's for a diprotic acid like this. Ka1 is in reference to the loss of the first proton. So the, the K for this reaction is called the Ka1 of carbonic acid. And so we write the products of this reaction, hydronium and bicarbonate on top, and then on, on the bottom, carbonic acid. Of course, we don't include water. And so uh, when you look at Appendix C, which has all the Ka's, you're going to see for polyprotic acid, they'll have more than one Ka. They'll have a Ka1 and two. If it's a triprotic acid, it'll have three. The Ka1 is the Ka for the loss of the very first proton. So here we've lost one proton. We make bicarbonate. So that the the the, the Ka for carbonic acid is is the Ka1 here for carbonic acid. But then there's a second loss of a proton that's possible. So this this uh, carb this uh, carbonic acid here, or the, sorry, this bicarbonate ion can lose yet another proton. So if we write this down now, and this is the Ka1 for carbonic acid. Now we have a second loss of a proton here. So we have a second reaction. And the hardest part about these, again, is writing down the reaction. So you recognize the loss of the first proton. You get the conjugate base of that one. It still has a proton. So now this one loses a second proton. And then that's all the protons it has to lose. And so we get now the conjugate base of this guy, which is the loss of a second proton, no more H. And again, the charge goes down by one unit from negative one down to negative two. The water has now picked up a proton, and so we get H3O plus. So the K for the K for this reaction is called the Ka2 of carbonic acid. So basically the Ka of bicarbonate, if we were another way to say this would be if we wanted the Ka of bicarbonate ion that is actually called the Ka2 of carbonic acid okay uh, because that's that that's the way it's listed in the chart it's the loss of the second proton from carbonic acid so that is the Ka of bicarbonate ion and so that Ka the expression is equal to the products of this reaction hydronium and carbonate ion divided by the reactant here, bicarbonate. And that value happens to be 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. And so you can see these differ too in, in value in size by 1,000 or so. And so the result is that the Ka1 has a lot more impact on the amount of hydronium in solution than does the Ka2. And we're actually going to verify that with a calculation. Uh, and so these are a number of different Ka1s and Ka2s for polyprotic acids. So you can see that, for example, sulf sulfuric acid is a very good example here. Sulfuric acid is a, a strong acid in the loss of the first proton, but then it has a second proton to lose, which actually has a, a Ka that's you know not not too small, but not too huge either. Uh, phosphoric acid has a Ka3 because it has a, a third proton that it can lose. Uh, <clears throat> and one thing I want to point out again is that the Ka2s are generally much smaller 
than the Ka1s. And so it's going to be the loss of the first proton that, that uh, contributes significantly to the pH. And the second one is not. Uh, let's show that with a calculation here. Calculate the pH of a 0 0.02 molar carbonic acid solution. So what makes this complicated is we're going to have to do a first equilibrium for the Ka1, then we're going to have to follow that up with a second equilibrium using the Ka2. So we've got carbonic acid here. Again, it's going to give a proton to water. We get So it loses one proton, it still has one more. We get bicarbonate ion and hydronium. Okay, so we're asked to calculate the pH, which means the pH at equilibrium. So we've got to make an ice table. So we make the ice table and here it is. It's 0.2 molar of carbonic acid to start. We've got about zero hydronium, zero bicarbonate ion. So this reaction has to go forward. So we put minus X here, plus X, plus X. And our equilibrium concentrations are gonna be 0.2 minus X for the carbonic acid, X for, for the hydronium and X4 bicarbonate. Uh, so our Ka1, the expression here, is going to be hydronium times bicarbonate on top, on the bottom, carbonic acid. So now we plug in our values. X for each of these goes on top. On the bottom is 0.02 minus X. And these are going to be equal to the Ka1, which is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. So let's take all of this and move it on to the next slide so we can solve for x. So we had this. We had 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7 is x times x over 0.2 minus x, or 0.02 minus x, rather. Uh, so going back here, yeah. So point, x times x over 0.02 minus x is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. So we got that right here. Now, again, uh, <clears throat> we'd like to use the simplifying assumption if we can. So we don't have to solve the quadratic or do anything fancy. We can't take the square root of both sides. That's the easy way, the first thing we should always check because this is not squared, so we can't do that. So our next uh, course of action is to try to use a simplifying assumption. So we do our pre-check. Our pre-check involves taking this initial concentration, dividing by the Ka, and seeing if that is greater than 400. And it is way over 400. If we, I mean, it, it's way, way, way greater than 400, obviously. You could just look at it and know that. So we, we should be clear to use the simplifying assumption. So I'm going to assume that 0.02 minus x, x is really small, so when we subtract uh, x from 0.02, it does not change the value of 0.02 very much. And so we've got uh, 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7 is x squared over 0.02. Uh, so now we're going to solve for x. So just like last time, uh, you know, we'll multiply both sides by 0 0.020 this time, uh, times 0 0.020. Let's do that. So 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7 <clears throat> times 0 0.02. Okay. And then uh, so we get 8.6 times 10 to the minus 9. 8.6 times 10 to the minus 9 equals x squared. So now we're going to take the square root of both sides. So we're going to square root our answer. I don't want to cube root it. <laughs> There's something wiggy about this calculator that likes to do that. Square root? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it just wants. To... Oh, it's because I'm hitting shift. Okay, square root answer. And we get uh, 9.3 times 10 to the minus 5 is x. Uh, and that is the concentration of, of the hydronium. It's also the concentration of the uh, bicarbonate ion. That was x. Now, the that was these guys here. So those were x. Uh, the carbonic acid is 0.02 minus x. So uh, we would do 0.02 minus x. So that's 0.02 minus 9.3 times 10 to the minus 5. So 0 0.02 minus answer equals, and we get, you know, about 0 0.02 as we'd expect. Uh, it's not any different really. Uh, and, and 
if it was, that would be a problem, right? Because we assumed that X was so small that it would not affect this. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't really change it any, at any at all. Uh, if we round it to, you know, here we still get, you know, one point or 2.0 times 10 to the minus two, which is this. So we've now figured out the concentrations of all of these, but the issue is that the bicarbonate ion can still lose some H H plus. Uh, what I'm going to demonstrate to you now is that the the concentration of H3O plus that gets generated from the carbonic acid is going to be very small compared to this. And so it's not going to really have an impact. Let's, let's do the calculation though. So we're going to carry this information forward. We're going to use this for the next one. And we, uh, as a post check, it's always good to do a post check too. I think we can be pretty sure here, but uh, we want this to be less than 5% of this. So we take the, the X, we divide by our initial concentration, and is this uh, less than 5%? Well, we can actually calculate it, but 9.3 times 10 to the minus five, divide by 0 0.02 times 100. And it is, uh, 0 0.47 percent well below five percent so our our uh, simplifying assumption was totally justified no problem there next now we're going to do the part where the bicarbonate ion gives up a proton and makes carbonate. So this is gonna contribute a little bit more to our hydronium concentration. The question is how much more? So let's take a look. Uh, this is carried over from the last one. So we had that our, our before from the first dissociation, our concentration of car bicarbonate was 9.3 times 10 to the minus five, and our concentration of hydronium was 9.3 times 10 to the minus five. We've got no carbonate, uh, and we're going to assume this reaction is going forward because we got a zero here, so that gives us Q is zero. And so we're going to do for equilibrium minus X, or change rather, minus X plus X plus X. So our, our bicarbonate ion concentration is 9.3 times 10 to the minus five minus X. Our hydronium is going to be the 9.3 times 10 to the minus five we got last time plus X more, and carbonate is the zero plus X, so it's just X. So what we're gonna do is, uh, what we're pointing out here is that Ka2 is much, much less than 9.3 times 10 to the minus five. Uh, we could check again, if we divide, divide these, so uh, we divide this over this, is it greater than 400? Yes, yes, definitely, it's more like a million. Right, initial concentration divided by the K, is that greater than 400? Yes, by far. So we can use our simplifying assumption. Our Ka2 here is gonna be the Ka for this reaction, hydronium times carbonate ion divided by bicarbonate. We're going to plug in our equilibrium concentrations from our ice table. So for hydronium, we plug in 9.3 times 10 to the minus five, and we're, like I said, we're assuming that X is small, so we're going to assume that when we add X, it's very small here, right? Uh, that's our simplifying assumption, and we're gonna add, think, we're gonna assume that when we subtract X, that is also very small. And so then, then this is X. So it turns out that X, or the concentration of carbonate, is gonna be equal to Ka2, and Ka2 was 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. And the concentration of hydronium was unchanged, as X is so small. Uh, and, and we can see here, it is very small, right? Uh, we could do a post check if we wanted to. We could compare X to our initial concentration, 9.3 times 10 to the minus five. It's, it's way less than 5%. I mean, it is like a million times smaller than this. So we're, we're totally good. X is tiny. What we're saying is that the contribution of the second equilibrium to the concentration of the protons was extremely small. And so now if we finally want the, uh, the pH, we take the negative log of the hydronium concentration, which was this plus X, but X was tiny, so it's just 9.3 times 10 to the minus five. So we take the negative log of 
9.3 times 10 to the minus 5, and we get 4.03. And again, we had two sig figs in our concentration, so we write our result to two decimals after 4.03. Okay, and so the, the take home message here was that in general, if we go back and look at the Ka values, the Ka2 values are so small generally compared to the Ka1 values that the second, the loss of the second proton does not contribute significantly to the concentration of hydronium. And so the pH can really be determined uh, based on the Ka1 if you're doing this for a diprotic acid, just a diprotic acid. But the value of this is that if we needed the Ka for bicarbonate ion, for example, the Ka for the bicarbonate ion is the Ka2. It's the, the Ka after this first one has lost a proton. Uh, and so that's an important thing to keep in mind, what those Ka values are good for. We will use those later on. Okay. Finally, uh, weak bases. And so just like we had for acids, we had a Ka. For bases, we're going to have a KB uh, for weak bases. And so the general form, like for the general form for acid, we had HA. The general form for base is going to be B. And when you, when you do the reaction with base, again, you have to write the water because what a base is, is a proton acceptor. So you need something to accept the proton from. That's the water. So in these reactions, the B is going to be the base, the water is going to be the acid, it's going to be giving the proton. So the water gives the proton, and then you get the conjugate acid of this B, which is BH+. It has the H plus attached now, the base has an H plus attached on it. And the conjugate base for the water is going to be the H2O, but it's lost one H, and the charge is down by one, from zero down to negative one. So here's the base, this is the acid, and, and this is the conjugate acid of the base. This is the conjugate base of the acid of water. In this case, water is acting like an acid, giving a proton. So if we're writing a K for this, again, okay, so the way you wrote the reaction with acid, let's just compare these. Well, for acid, it was HA plus water. That was for acid, right, for acid here. And that is in equilibrium with uh, the H3O plus when the water acts like a base and accepts the proton and the A minus. And we called the KC for this reaction, we called it KA of the acid HA. Okay. So likewise here, we have a base, but it's acting like a base accepting the proton from water. This is the hard part writing the equation for base except a proton from water. For the acid, this is really the hard part. Write the equation for acid with water, acid giving the proton to water. If you can do that, then all you got to do is write the Kc for that reaction, and it's the Ka. If you can write this base reaction, then all you got to do is write the Kc for this reaction, and you've written the, the, the uh, expression for the Kb. It's going to be the products, BH plus and hydroxide concentration, those are the products over the reactant concentration of the base, and we leave out water because it's the bulk liquid. That's the KB. Once you've written the reaction, you write the K just like you write any other K. The hard part is writing the reaction. So the KC for this reaction is called KB for the base B, and it's written exactly the same way as you'd write any K. BH plus over hydro, times hydroxide products over reactants, base. Now the issue here that makes this a bit different from the acids is that uh, you know part of this is going to be hydroxide. So we're going to get hydroxide concentration, then we're going to have to go through a couple of steps in order to calculate the pH. Uh, but we can calculate the pH if we get the hydroxide concentration. So here's an example with an actual weak acid, probably the weak, or sorry, weak base, probably the one weak base that you're familiar with. Uh, one thing I'm going to point out is that uh, when you look, I would take a look at Appendix C, make sure you look at that. One thing you're going to notice is that all the bases, almost all of them, have nitrogen atom in them. 
it's because of the lone pair. The lone pair can make the coordinate covalent bond with the H plus as we saw earlier. And so um, basically any, uh, lots and lots of molecules with nitrogen atoms in them behave as bases and as weak bases. And so you're gonna see almost all the weak bases that you're gonna encounter are gonna be weak bases because they have a nitrogen atom somewhere in the structure. Uh, anyway, this is the base, so it's going to accept the proton. The water is going to give the proton. And so what we're going to get is not NH3, but the conjugate acid, which is NH4 plus one extra H and the plus charge. And the water lost the H plus, so now it's down to one hydrogen, and the charge goes down by one unit from zero down to negative one. Okay. So the KB for this, for ammonia, this would be the KB specifically. For ammonia, it would be ammonium ion concentration times hydroxide concentration divided by ammonia concentration. No water, because it's bulk liquid. And so here's a number of KBs. Again, look at all these weak bases. All got nitrogen atoms in them. Uh, nitrogen atom is basically the definition of weak base. And then you have their conjugate acids. The way you write the conjugate acid is you add you add the extra H onto where the nitrogen is. So see the nitrogen's here, you add the H there, nitrogen's here, you add the H there. Here they put the nitrogen here, or the hydrogen here, it's attaching to this nitrogen. Uh, here they're putting the hydrogen here, attaching to this nitrogen. And you get a plus charge because the H plus added. So these are the conjugate acids of these bases. Uh, another thing that we're going to start to talk about soon is that, uh, and we'll do this in the next lecture, uh, if you have the KB of a base, you can find the KA for its conjugate acid. And if you have the KA for an acid, you can find the KB for its conjugate base. We're going to use that extensively in the next lecture. Uh, but I won't get into that just yet. What we want to do is use the KB. That's what we're going to do here. And so we're going to say, okay, if we've got a base, the initial concentration and the KB, can we figure out the pH, just like we did for acid, but for base? So calculate the pH of a 0.4 molar ammonia solution. At 25 degrees Celsius, the KB of ammonia is 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So again, hard part is writing the reaction. We need to write the reaction, make an ice table, uh, plug in our concentrations in terms of X, solve for X, get the hydroxide concentration, use that to get the pH. So I'm gonna write the reaction first, ammonia and water, the water gives the proton, the ammonia accepts it, makes the conjugate acid ammonium ion and hydroxide. We make an ice table. Initial concentration of ammonia, 0.4. Ammonium ion, zero. Hydroxide ion, not exactly zero, but close to zero. Okay. And then we, uh, but since we have no products, this reaction can't go backwards. Q is zero, which is less than K. So this reaction will go forward. So we write minus X for the base, plus X for ammonium ion, plus X for hydroxide. Water is not in the equilibrium, so we didn't have to write anything for that. Uh, so our equilibrium concentration is gonna be 0.4 minus X for the ammonia, uh, zero plus X or X for ammonium ion, and zero plus X or X for hydroxide ion. So now we write the, the expression for KB. It is ammonium ion and hydroxide ion on top, and then the bottom, ammonia. We plug in our values, X and X. Oh, we're gonna do that on the next slide here. So uh, we're gonna take this KB, we're gonna carry it over. We're gonna plug in X and X on the top. This is the KB right here. So I'll just write it again here. So KB was ammonium ion times hydroxide ion concentration over the ammonia. And we had from our ice table, well KB was from the problem 1.8 times 10 minus five. From our ice table, it was X and X for ammonium and hydroxide. And for ammonia it was 0.4 minus X. And uh, we're going to assume again that X is small. Uh, not a bad idea to do the pre-check. Why don't we do the pre-check? Uh, so to do the pre-check, we put the initial concentration, 0 0.40 over the K, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. We calculate that and we wanna know that it, this is more, this is greater than 400. 
0 0.4 divided by 1.8, that's 10 to the minus 5, and that is 22,000 about, like 22,000, I rounded, but that's definitely greater than 400. So our pre-check is good, which means that 0.4 minus x, the x is going to be small, so when we subtract that from 0.4, it does not really change the value of 0.4. And so now uh, we can solve for x. We'll multiply both sides times 0 0.40. Uh, and so that's going to cancel the 0 0.40. That means it's supposed to be a 4. Uh, and so we can calculate that now. 0 0.4 times 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And we get 7.2 times 10 to the minus 6 equals x squared. All right. Now we take the square root square root and we get x is 2.6 or 2.7 times 10 to the minus 3 or 0 0.0027 if we write it like that okay and so uh, now it might be a good idea to do a post check why don't we do a post check okay, this is the pre check pre check why don't we do a post check so the post check we want to make sure that x is not greater than 5% of our initial concentration. So we go 0 0.0027 over 0 0.4 times 100%. And we want to know that that's less than 5%. So we calculate 0 0.0027 divided by 0 0.4 times 100. And we get 0.68% about. Definitely less than 5%. We're good. So we passed our pre-check, we passed our post-check, and so we're good to go. Now X is our concentration of hydroxide. So we can't just take the next, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they forget that they're, when they're doing a base problem, their X is hydroxide and not hydronium. You can't just take the negative log of this and get the hydronium concentration or the, the pH. You need to first get the hydronium concentration. So hydronium concentration is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by our hydroxide concentration. 1 uh, times 10 to the minus 14 or Kw uh, divided by 0 0.0027. And so we get a hydronium concentration of 3.7 times 10 to the minus 12. Now we can get the pH. The pH will be the negative log of this. So negative log of that answer. And we get a pH of 1 point, or sorry, 11.43, 11.43. And again, with sig figs, we have two sig figs in this value. So we write the result to two after the decimal place. And so that's how you get the pH of a weak base solution. So as I said, uh, there is a relationship between Ka of an acid and the Kb of its conjugate base, or Kb for a base and the Ka of its conjugate acid. Uh, when we get to the next lecture, I'm gonna show you how to interconvert between these and also how to determine the pH of a salt solution and whether it, that solution will be acidic, basic, or neutral. So I'll see you in the next lecture.